Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to this session. Um, in the previous lecture, uh, we have covered some aspects of bank management. Uh, we discussed um, the liquidity management and subsequently we have covered uh, asset management. And today's session, uh, we will be discussing uh, liability management and capital adequacy management. So, coming to the first part, liability management, it actually uh, related to the acquiring of funds at low cost by the banks. And it also, uh, the liability management goes well along with the uh, asset management as well, that is maintaining a balance between maturities of their assets and their liabilities in order to maintain liquidity and to facilitate lending and thereby also to make profit. And recently, liability management has gained more attention due to rise of large banks, especially money center banks. So, as a result of money center bank, expansion of money center bank, there is expansion of overnight loan markets, new financial instruments such as negotiable uh, certificates of deposits, etc and checkable deposits as a result the checkable deposits have decreased in importance as sources of bank funds let's now talk about capital adequacy management there is a trade off between safety and returns to equity holders the capital the equity capital so the benefit the owners of a bank benefit the owners of a bank by making their investment safe that is one is costly to owners of a bank because the higher the bank capital, uh, lower the return on equity. We will be discussing this point in detail in subsequent uh, discussion. So, there is a choice depends on the state of the economy and the levels of confidence in the economy. So, the overall health of the economy, the socio-economic uh, soundness uh, of the economy, uh, it also depends uh, based on that actually all these factors matter in determining the trade-off between safety and returns to equity holders. So, capital adequacy, one of the key things here is that ensuring sufficient capital, adequate capital that helps bank prevent bank failure. So, the amount of capital affects return for the owners of the bank as well. And that is one. At the same time, from regulatory perspective, there is clear-cut regulatory requirement of the required amount of capital in the bank, the proportion of capital to the total assets of the bank. So, let us explain, uh, examine these aspects by do using a simple comparative example of two banks. One is keeping high capital, that is called high capital bank. And let us compare this one with another bank who is having low capital as compared to its total assets. Let us call it a uh, low capital bank. So, let us start this one looking at the assets and liabilities of this bank. Both banks having the total assets of 100 that the deposits uh, reserves 10 million and loans 10 million. And for the low capital bank also, we are pre presenting the same reserves and same amount of loans. And now look at the liability side. This bank having 90, the high capital bank is having 90 million dollar as the deposits and its equity capital is 10 million, that is the 10 percentage of the total assets. That means uh, you can see 10 million or the total assets is uh, 100 million. Now, look at the low capital bank, uh, you can see that this bank is having 96 million deposits, but the bank capital is only uh, 4 million. So, in both scenario, look at this bank that the banks with the high capital 10 million and bank having low capital that is 4 million. 
then let's see if there is some non performing assets so in case of because banks will be having lots of non performing assets like loan bad loans so in case of loan write off if there is an npa for them so they have to write it off after certain period of time so suppose these both banks suppose that both banks are having uh, 5 million dollars of bad loan non performing assets and they are they have to write it off in this case let us see how both bank how their capital uh, helps them in preventing bank failure so coming to the bank that is keeping high capital adequacy ratio that is the 10 percentage then you know that when they are writing off uh, 5 million so uh, now the loan became only 85 out of these 5 is already written off so what happened that they finance this loss by taking from this uh, bank capital that the 10 million out of this now uh, here actually this write off is taken by 5 million from uh, bank capital right so then they manage you know that when there is a loan write off uh, actually this if they because of that suddenly their assets declining and eventually one one possibility is that bank may collapse so here the high bank capital they could uh, get uh, 5 million they can easily take from their bank capital what about the next bank the small bank a uh, small capital bank small capital bank so if they had lost the here they are to anyway they have, they need uh, 5 million here so 4 million obviously they can take from here if for suppose then they have to borrow as well so you can see that uh, actually the bank capital is reduced to uh, minus 1 million so in this case you can see that actually the bank is having deficiency of funds what if is this suppose look at the bank that low capital bank suppose there is a deposit outflow as well suppose at that time uh, the small bank small the small capital bank cannot raise money because they are already having capital deficiency there bank capital there is a shortage so this is one thing one reason why banks keeping more equity capital as proportion to their total assets you know that is in order to prevent bank failure and because of this reason this fact the uh, regulatory authorities the central banks they are also they, because it's their interest the central bank in the, in the large interest of the economy to ensure that there is a sound banking system it is it's not at all at the interest of the economy and society to how banks getting failed so they want to prevent bank failure so because of that one of the regulatory requirement is that the central bank will be asking the commercial banks to keep uh, adequate capital with their in, in matching with their total assets so in the capital adequacy management let us discuss some of the concept that is being widely used and uh, applied while discussing capital adequacy management the one first concept is called uh, return on assets so that means how the amount of capital affects the return to equity holders so the return on assets is the net profit after taxes divided by the total assets so roa shortly we call it roa ROA reflect how efficient the bank is and is an important parameter for manager because per unit of assets how much profit they are making and then second it is only second secondary important for owners because what they are interested is that not actually the net profit the profit per asset they are actually interested uh, profit per equity because an equity holder a shareholder in a bank for the most important concern for them is that per unit of share how much dividend they are getting how much profit they are getting how much dividend they are getting so in this case let us discuss the second concept called return on equity so here the return on equity it means per unit the profit uh, after taxes per unit of capital this is called return on equity that the net profit after taxes per dollar of equity capital and here this concept that the return on equity uh, it reflects how profitable the bank is because in the previous concept we 
seen that ROA it reflects how efficient the bank is that means per unit profit you profit per unit of assets but the return on equity it reflects how profitable the bank is and you know obviously you know that this parameter is very important for the owners that the shareholders of the bank and then only it's important for the managers so the shareholders they'll be looking how much profit they get per unit of uh, share they are holding with the bank right so in that way this is very important for the owners and the first one roa is more important for the managers of the bank so what we are seeing that later on in our discussion we will be linking these both aspects you can see that what are the objective function uh, of the managers and what are the objective function of the owners of the bank or the shareholders that we will be discussing in our another context when we discuss conflict of interest con er, er, concept in one of the in subsequent sessions so now let's look at the relationship between ROA and ROE and actually based on this because ROA we have defined that net profit after taxes divided by assets and ROE that the net profit after taxes divided by the equity capital. So what we can see that both can be the relationship between ROA and ROE can be expressed by the equity multiplier. So the equity multiplier that we are going to uh, write down here shortly the amount of assets per dollar of equity capital that means per unit of capital how much uh, assets a bank can raise so the roa times em so we are going to write it like that roe is equal to uh, roa times equity multiplier you can see here is that the roe is equal to roa times uh, equity multiplier so shortly um, you can see that the equity multiplier equity multiplier is the amount of assets per dollar of equity capital so this is um, the relation this is the equity multiplier uh, that the assets uh, per unit of capital so let us take an illustrative example with a high vis-a-vis -vis low bank capital so suppose assume that here a high bank capital bank it is initially has 100 million of assets and 100 million of equity and which gives it an equity multiplier of 10 that is uh, 10 million divided by uh, 100 million divided by 10 million right so the assets divided by the equity capital so the equity multiplier here is so let's look at another bank having same amount of assets that the low capital bank but it has only 4 million of equity equity capital so you know that the equity multiplier is higher uh, equaling uh, 25 so the low capital bank and the high capital bank having equal amount of assets having different equity multiplier so that means the asset that they are generating by a given unit of capital equity capital so, so in this case suppose these banks have been equally well run so that they both have the same return on assets for example one percentage let us uh, assume that each bank both banks make a same return on assets that is one percentage so now look at the return on equity for high capital bank and the low capital bank so you know that the return on equity for high capital bank one percentage times 10 so you know that this bank the return on equity per unit of capital the high capital bank is earning 10 percentage and what about the low capital bank the return on equity for the low capital bank is 25 percentage and obviously you know that who is more happier the equity holder in low capital bank are clearly a lot happier than the equity holders in high capital bank because you know they are earning more than twice as as high a return and obviously you know that higher the dividend they are getting and the share price their uh, stock price also will increase so given the return on assets the lower the bank capital higher the return for the owners of the bank here 
So, in this case from this we can also relate uh, discuss another concept actually this equity multiplier another name of this equity multiplier is the leverage ratio that means with a given amount of capital how much they are they were able to leverage how much assets they are able to acquire that means uh, the leverage ratio is the assets divided by equity capital so in this case you can see that the equity multiplier that actually the assets and uh, divided by the equity capital this is called the leverage ratio and the leverage ratio measures a bank's core capital to its total assets the ratio uses tier 1 capital to judge uh, how leveraged a bank is in relation to its consolidated assets so coming to the tier 1 capital it represents a bank's common equity uh, retained earnings reserves and certain instruments with discretionary dividends and no maturity so the tier 1 assets are ones that can be easily liquidated if a bank needs capital in the event of financial crisis so higher the tier 1 leverage ratio higher the likelihood of the bank withstanding negative shocks to its balance sheet the leverage ratio is used as a tool by central monetary authorities to ensure the capital adequacy of banks and place constraints on the degree uh, to which a financial company can leverage its capital base. Let us now uh, discuss the strategies for managing bank capital. So, one thing we saw here that if both banks the example that we have taken suppose both banks the low capital bank and high capital bank if both of them were able to generate equal ab able to acquire same amount of assets and able to earn same amount of same uh, rate of return. So, in that case you know that the which we just covered now we just discussed that means discuss that means the low bank capital low capital bank will be earning more profit their shareholders will be more happier a lot happier so sometime in that is the case what actually read that sometime they need to reduce if they want to maximize profit if they want to earn more profit so at the, if that is the case they have to reduce the uh, size of the bank capital so to lower the amount of capital relative to assets and raise the equity multiplier what they have to do that one option is to reduce the amount of bank capital by buying back some of the bank stock calling back some of buying back some of the issued stock by the bank that is one option and the second option is reduce bank's capital by paying out higher dividends to its stakeholders that means uh, reduce the amount of the retained profit the bank is keeping that amount they retain with the bank and distribute more dividends uh, to the bank so that the net total capital of the bank will be coming down uh, on the other hand what if a bank is short on capital relative to assets because it does not have sufficient cushion to prevent a bank failure in that case the bank can raise capital for the bank by having it issue equity issuing more equity issuing more cash share and the second option is to raise capital by reducing the bank's dividends to shareholders that means reduce the dividend the distribution of dividend to the shareholders so that it can become the part of retained earnings and that it can put it into capital account as well and the third option is to shrink the size of the bank that means keep capital at the same level but reduce the bank's assets by making fewer loans or by selling off securities and using the proceeds to reduce the bank's liabilities so in general the third alternative of shrink that the shrinking the size of the bank is opted because um, 
raising the capital for the bank by issuing equity it, it may not sound well it may not go well with other shareholders that means diluting the share it won't go well with the uh, shareholders and similarly reducing the dividends to the shareholders it also won't go well with the shareholders so let's now further discuss discuss more about the credit risk and interest rate risk these two concepts let us discuss in depth now so coming to the first part managing credit risk it is well part of important part of asset management of the bank so importantly we will be discussing uh, the ways in which banks deal with credit risk so there are different options that banks used to deal managing the credit risk that means um, when bank is making making a loan so at that time the credit risk that the default risk the bank is facing so at that time banks use various tools in order to reduce the credit risk or in order to manage the credit risk so one of the thing is that screening and monitoring of potential borrowers so coming to the screening part they screen the customers the borrowers against the possible adverse selection that means when the potential borrowers the banks with the best interest of the banks the potential borrowers should be having uh, should be low risk borrowers they should be having uh, low default risk ideally zero default risk is most preferred by highly preferred by banks so in order to do that banks will be screening customers bor potential borrowers so that uh, they don't have adverse selection issues so adverse selection issues means mainly the bank borrowers those who are high risk borrowers they have high tendency to borrow from the bank and then make a default then obviously you know that as a result the bank will be having that uh, unable to recover its loan and then finally it will lead to eventually it would lead to bank failure and then comes the second part is specialization in lending that means through information collection so you may wonder because one puzzling feature of a bank lending is that a bank often specializes in lending to local firms or to firms in particular industries such as energy so one of the thing that we discuss in the previous session is that bank in fact bank should diversify but at the same time now uh, we are discussing that in order to manage credit risk we also talk that sometime bank specialize as well so what this actually a really a uh, little bit contrasting statement that means in one say instance we are saying that bank should be diversified its portfolio and now another instance we are saying that uh, they are going to specialize in lending so in in one sense this behavior seems surprising because it means that the bank is no diversifying its portfolio of loans and thus is exposing itself to more risk but from another perspective such specialization makes perfect sense you know how because the adverse selection problem it requires that the bank screen out bad credit risk it is easier for the bank to collect information about local firms and determine their credit worthiness than to collect comparable information on firms that are farther away so similarly by concentrating its lending on firms in specific industries the bank becomes more knowledgeable about these industries and is therefore better able to predict which firms will be able to make timely payment on their debt so it is advantage borrower has an incentive to engage in risky activities that make it less likely that the loans will be paid off to reduce this moral hazard financial institutions must write provisions that is restrictive 
covenants monitoring and restrictive covenants into loan contract that restrict borrowers from engaging in risky activities so by monitoring borrowers activities to see whether they are complying with the restrictive covenants and by enforcing covenants the covenants uh, if they are not lenders can make sure that borrowers are not taking on risk at their expense so the need for banks and other financial institutions to engage in screening and monitoring explains why they spend so much money on auditing and information collecting activities so another component is long term customer relationship building long term customer relationship if a prospective borrower has had a checking or savings account a loan with a bank over a long period of time a loan officer can look at past activity on the accounts and learn quite a bit about the borrowers the balances in the checking and savings accounts tell the banker how liquid the potential borrower is and at what time of year the borrower has a strong need for cash a review of the checks of the the borrower has written reveals borrower supplies supplies as well if the borrower has borrowed previously from the bank the bank has a record of the loan payments as well thus long term customer relationships reduce the cost of information collection and make it easier to screen out bad credit risk so the need for uh, monitoring by lenders adds to the importance of long term customer relationship so if the borrowers has borrowed from the bank before the bank has already established procedures for monitoring the customers therefore the cost of monitoring long term customers are lower than the cost of monitoring new customers and in the next session we will discuss some more aspects of uh, managing credit risk um, that include compensating balance <laughs> credit rationing uh, etc thank you